right, we're going to wrap up our Italy and Germany case studies uh, with a look at the international responses to these aggressive actions of these two nations uh, through the 1930s. So this is going to serve as a little bit of a review of everything we've talked about over the last uh, many videos. Uh, first, I want to I want to touch on on the British appeasement policy going into the Second World War. Now, now this is um, a word appeasement that that really has kind of a bad name because of what ends up happening uh, with the Second World War. Obviously, this appeasement policy is a failure, but we have to remember at the time that this policy was being being executed, it was working. Like it, it stopped any further conflict until it didn't stop further conflict. So, so this was the the legitimate British foreign policy um, towards Germany at the time: appeasement, making concessions to avoid uh, a greater conflict. And there's a lot of reasons why Britain took this policy. First, uh, public opinion. This is a democracy, and they've got to respond to public opinion. And anti-war sentiments are strong in Britain uh, through the 1930s, and they only increase with news coming out of Spain of the uh, the bombing of civilian cities uh, during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, the demands that Hitler was making uh, seemed justified to some. Why can't Hitler Hitler rebuild a military? Why can't Hitler, uh, can't Hitler reoccupy the Rhineland? Why can't there be an Anschluss between Austria and Germany? To many in Britain that thought the Treaty of Versailles was already too harsh, um, they thought these these just uh, these uh, these demands that Hitler was making uh, were just. Justified. Um, there was bipartisan support for appeasement um, in, um, in, in England. So this is not just a, a Labour Party thing, which, which is the party of Neville Chamberlain. Um, this is, um, th there's economic pressures uh, calling for uh, avoiding any future conflict. Wars are very expensive, and Britain is dealing with the, the hardships of the Great Depression. Um, you've got British global commitments that are taking attention and resources away from uh, of, of the, the problems on the continent. Um, you know, you've got uh, independence movements growing uh, in, in India. You've got um, problems in, in British Palestine with, with a, a, a rising Arab revolt against British control of Palestine. And these are taking uh, attention and resources away from Britain's uh, look at the, uh, the continental problems. And then Neville Chamberlain as the prime minister. Um, he's got little faith in the League of Nations. The League of Nations has already proved itself uh, to, to not be an effective force in stopping these aggressive actions. And he legitimately thought that Adolf Hitler could be worked with. So we're going to look into to a number of these, uh, these issues um, that were uh, contributing to this British appeasement policy and this, this non-intervention stance. First, uh, the weakness of the League of Nations. Remember, from its onset, the League of Nations lacked the United States as a, as a credible uh, partner and as an economic resource. Um, so any kinds of economic sanctions the League of Nations would be putting on a nation, the United States doesn't necessarily have to follow. Many members of the League thought the Treaty of Versailles should have been revised themselves, and that's all Adolf Hitler is doing in the beginning. Um, the League of Nations showed weakness in the face of aggressive acts, first from Japan, then from Italy. And, and it's really showing that countries are, are driven by their own self-interests rather than lofty ideals and league principles um, as they were drafted back in, in 1919 and 20. The United States is an isolationist nation. The United States, as, as the major economic force in the world, wants to remain politically isolated from European conflicts. They want to maintain trade relations, but they certainly don't want to get into any European conflicts. The public sentiment in the United States was deeply against any involvement in foreign wars, and this is um, also going to manifest itself in a series of neutrality acts passed by the American Congress, signed by the president, um, that will make involvement in future conflicts more difficult. 
in the East, the Soviet Union um, sees that the Western powers are, are more antagonistic to communism than even fascism might be. Um, and, and this um, is, is demonstrated clearly for the Soviet Union when, when Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union are not invited to the Munich conference, when, when Britain and France and Italy are all getting together to work out an arrangement with Germany about Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union wasn't included. This is only going to grow Stalin's distrust of the Western powers. And of course, Joseph Stalin thought that he could work with Adolf Hitler to bring his own foreign policy goals into being. Um, and of course, Stalin has designs on moving into Eastern Europe, countries like Poland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. So then let's go kind of step by step through all of these moves towards the Second World War and how the international community was reacting. When it came to rearmament, there was sympathy in Britain towards reworking some of these tenets of the Treaty of Versailles. And, and Britain went so far as to even sign uh, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement that essentially allowed Germany to violate the Treaty of Versailles and rebuild a navy to 35% of the size of Britain with an equal number of submarines. Why would Britain do this? They're hoping to avoid, um, one, a greater conflict, but they don't want to get into any kind of expensive naval arms race. So if you throw Germany a bone and let them have a small navy, that might prevent, in Britain's mind, Germany from wanting to grow a larger navy. When Italy invaded Abyssinia, there was public outrage from the League of Nations states and condemnation from the League. Um, any early attempts, though, to, to negotiate a solution to this problem in Abyssinia had failed. Uh, the, the League will issue economic sanctions against Italy, but not all member nations are going to follow through. And, and they're, they're not maybe as extreme as they could have been. The Suez Canal, for example, was never closed. And the United States, not being a member of the League, actually increased exports to Italy during this time. Hitler's remilitarization in the Rhineland is then going to divert attention back to the problems in Europe. And, and that remilitarization of the Rhineland itself received no opposition from Britain and France. When the Spanish Civil War takes place, uh, Britain and France are each committed to non-intervention, um, not wanting to see a, a wider war. They are not going to send troops. Um, but the Soviet Union, Italy, and Germany, who also sign a non-intervention pledge, will ultimately violate that agreement and send their own troops to support um, the two factions in the Spanish Civil War. Um, Britain itself, wouldn't even have been on the side of, of, the, uh, of the Republicans in, uh, in the Spanish Civil War because they were communist supported and, and Britain couldn't bring itself to support uh, the faction that was pro-communist or at least having some communist support. When it came to Anschluss, uh, Britain and uh, the British and the French protested this action. It was certainly a violation of the Treaty of Versailles, but there was no action. Um, again, we, we talked about it before. Britain and France aren't going to send soldiers to, to fight Germany over Austria when Austrians themselves were not fighting for Austria. Italy was now supportive of Anschluss in 1938. They hadn't been earlier in 34. They were supportive now in 1938. The League of Nations showed itself um, following the Abyssinian crisis, not able to, to step up to an aggressive act like that. And, and many in Britain thought, thought the, the union of Austria and Germany was inevitable um, without force being used. It was going to happen. It's what the Austrians wanted. Ultimately, it's what the Germans wanted. So just let it be. When it comes to Czechoslovakia, uh, both Britain and France want to avoid Hitler's taking of Czechoslovakia, but they don't want to do it through military action, only negotiations. Those negotiations are going to come through the Munich Conference and then later the Munich Pact. Now, of course, Germany will then violate the Munich Pact and invade the rest of Czechoslovakia. And this is what finally gets Britain to move to take a firmer stance against Hitler and proclaim the, the, the defense of Poland. Not long after, uh, Italy is going to move into Albania, a country that it had already had a treaty of friendship with. Um, it's essentially going to be annexed by 
by by Italy. Uh, this is going to again receive condemnation, uh, and but but to Neville Chamberlain, it's going to show that these agreements with dictators just could not be trusted, and and Britain will follow this invasion of Albania with a guarantee to protect the borders of neighboring Greece. And then finally, we come to September of 1939, um, when Germany invaded Poland. And, and here we now get Britain and France each stepping up to their promises to, to defend Poland. Uh, Britain will issue an ultimatum on September 3rd, calling for a German withdrawal from Poland immediately. This was rejected and Britain uh, and then later France will declare war on Poland and the Second World War begins. Um, we'll be back in, uh, in a few days and start jumping into issues of the Second World War. Take care.